One day there was this young man coming into Kingdom Ministry School at Bethel. His name is Boris. He was a brother that was in Auschwitz concentration camp, and I knew it. But I never knew firsthand, never talked to anybody in the concentration camp. So I had him into the room at Bethel, got him in there just before 8 o'clock, and I said, Brother Boris, I want to know firsthand what was it like in the concentration camp? What makes us to survive? So Boris talked to us till 2.30 in the morning, nonstop. He had some things to say that made your hair stand right on edge. He said, as a young man, I was 21 years old when I went into Auschwitz concentration camp. I was cocky, he says, but God gave me a spirit, and he says, I knew that they would kill me. Can you imagine? He had this conviction that no matter what they did, they would never kill him. And he says, I believe this. He says, the day I walked into Auschwitz, I was met by an SS officer, and the SS officer stopped me, and he says, Boris, in two weeks we're going to send you to your God through the chimney. That was the gas chamber. And Boris, he says, I turned to that SS officer, and I says, you will never send me to my God to that chimney or any other chimney. And that SS officer got so mean, he kicked him in the back and laid him out. But they never did send Boris to his God through that chimney. Boris is in Texas today. He's an upholsterer. But Boris was one of five of our brothers in Auschwitz. They were selected to make the 200-mile death march in the mid of the winter. It was 19th of December. The temperature was 20. I don't know if it was above or below zero, but there was a cold chill factor was 50 below zero. The only clothes they had was the clothes on their back, and the only food that they could eat was the food that they could carry in their hands. And there was a 200-mile march on foot. And there was a brother, one of the brothers, one of the five was Brother Schneider. He was the branch overseer of Poland. And they walked through this chill and cold. And he says, I got tired and I was weak and I was a young man. And he said, Brother, oh, Boris said this Brother Schneider began to give out because he was aged and I had to carry him on my back. And he says, I was too weak, I was hungry, I didn't have anything to eat. And any man that fell was shot by the SS immediately. They shot him right through the head. So he says, I knew that I would have to let Brother Schneider drop. But instead of seeing him drop, he says, I waited till I reached a tree and I leaned him up against a tree. Then he said, I walked around a tree waiting for the, the shot to be fired. And he said, I stood there, and instead of a shot being fired, I hear Brother Schneider. Boris, he says. And he says, I turn around, and there's Schneider walking. And he's carrying in his hands a half loaf of bread. And I asked him, where did you get that bread? Not how, how come you're walking. Where did you get that bread? And he says, a man gave it to me. And Boris says, I looked for that man and I could never find him. The angel of the great Jehovah gave him that bread. Isn't that something, brothers? <laughs> they ate that bread and it gave them strength to move on in the chilled winter weather. And Schneider fell ill again with scarlet fever. He was just a living, dead man. And no one was supposed to even come near to him. And Boris says, I remember, but there he was in a barn, and we left him for dead. Skin and bones. And he said, I often wonder just what happened to Schneider. And one day I was walking down the city of Warsaw, Warsaw, as they call it, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe it. 
the Schneider. He's walking, he's fat, totally healthy. And he went up to him and he says, are you Schneider? And they embraced, tears cried, hugged each other. And he says, how, how come? How come you didn't die? He says, when you left, the Russians came. And a Russian officer saw me lying there, burning up with fever, and he brought a German woman in there, and he's pointed at me and he says, feed that man hot chicken soup and chicken three times a day. And this German woman said, where are we going to get chicken soup and chickens? You Russians have stolen everything from us. He says, woman, listen to me closely. You feed him chicken and chicken soup hot three times a day. The meal he misses, you're dead and another German will feed him. He says, would you believe it? I had cha hot chicken soup three times a day and chicken. And they nursed him back to health. Schneider grew fat. He was back in Poland as the branch coordinator of Poland till he died of old age. And you wonder if God can take care of you. Don't hesitate, brothers. God can be you faithful unto death, and you will have the crown of life. It's thrilling to hear these experiences because they tell of faith, they tell of a living faith, a motivating faith, an energizing faith in our brothers is something else. Now, our brothers in Russia and Poland have been in the underground work for years now. They're learning things. They're learning how to operate with the police, and the police are learning to live with them. You take, for example, now they have all the assemblies that you enjoy. They have the circuit assembly, the district assembly. They have the very same programs you have. They have the dramas with costumes and all. It may be in the woods somewhere or in the barn or an attic or in the basement, but they have it. Now you wonder how in the world is this possible? There's no law saying that you can't have a picnic, and we have some of the largest picnics in all Poland and in Russia. Anytime any boy and girl are holding hands, you'll see a circuit or district overseer there or coordinator saying, when is this culminating? Because we have some of the most beautiful weddings you ever saw. The largest attend weddings. They go for a week. Hotska on the level, meals and all. These are district assemblies, weddings. Please come there. And they never saw weddings quite like ours with demonstrations and the whole bit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We have funerals like you never saw, too. No law says you can't have a funeral. And any brother that's sick, not that we wish he die, but we, we keep tab on him. And lo and behold, they never saw funerals. We have police escort at our funerals. And they never saw funerals like ours in which brothers preach and show and give demonstrations. They know what they're do we're doing. Police know it, but they can't stop it. It's legal. It's lawful. And so we have our assembly brothers, and grand assemblies they are. And when Brother Schneider died, they tell me that 5,000 brothers attended his funeral. And they were there all day. And he was one of the anointed. Can you imagine? He must have taken time off to watch this. It would have been a grand old time for him to see this, you know. Yes, but when worse comes to worse, they're not afraid to meet in the barns, brothers. They're not afraid to sit on the ground or stand in the rain or walk through the mud to an assembly. The coordinator's wife today, Sister Adak, she gave her life for the truth. She's ex very sick because she championed the truth. I understand she lived in Europe. They use a lot of horses. They dug an underground underneath the horses, and they had a printing plant 
in the barn under the horses. And there's where this dear sister lived and carried on the underground work under animals in a barn. What a spirit of that woman. The spirit of the great Jehovah is in her, and you'll see her today. Witnessing is something else. But one of the greatest contributors to the witnessing work in Poland is none other than Cardinal Wyszynski of Poland himself. You wonder what in the world did the Cardinal do to contribute to our witness work? He had a Bible printed. And in the front part of the Bible, he wrote, wrote a letter encouraging the Catholic people of, of Poland to read and study the Bible. And he signs it with his own signature, his imprimatur of Cardinal Wyszynski of Poland. Throughout this Bible, and I do believe the Cardinal never looked inside of it, because the name Jehovah occurs over 7,000 times. And our brothers take this Bible from door to door with them because there's no law that says you can't take a Bible from door to door with you and preach. And our brothers go to the door with the Bible and the people will say, I'm not interested, but Cardinal Wyszynski to I move you. Cardinal Wyszynski said you should read and study the Bible. Oh, come on in, come on in. <laughs> and it's, it's just fantastic what is happening there. And so we bought up these Bibles. I think the first edition was some 100,000 Bibles, and our brothers went into all the bookstores, bought them all up. Second edition, know what happened? He took the name Jehovah out of it. That's how we know they didn't read it to begin with. But isn't that something? But well, we've got 100,000 Bibles with the Cardinal's own signature in it, and we use it in the ministry. But the Poles are a different stripe of people. You take, for example, this young man riding a bus, and he pulls out the watchtower, and he's reading the watchtower, and a priest sits next to him. And the priest can't help but look over, and he sees that it's the watchtower magazine. And the priest says to him, do you know, young man, it's against the law to be reading that magazine? And the brother doesn't say a word back. So the priest gets irritated, and he says, young man, if you keep reading that magazine, the devil is not going to be far from you. So the brother reached in the pocket, and he brought out, brought out a tape measure, and he says, would you say about seven inches, he says. <laughs> so this gives you an idea about what they think about it. They have no fear of the clergy at all there. They have a lot of informal witnessing going on. A brother drove up to a gasoline station, he says, Put it in the gallon of gas there. And the man says, man, he says, this jalopy is not going to take you very far. And the brother says, it'll take me to Armageddon. And this gasoline attendant tied in himself, knowing all the cities of, what? of Poland. He says, where's this Armageddon? You know, but he wouldn't ask the brother. But as soon as the brother left, he ran into the gasoline station, brought out a map, and began to try to find Armageddon. He couldn't find Armageddon. Every gasoline man stopping in there for gas, he would ask, you know, how about the city of Armageddon? You know where it is? Nobody knew. One day, one of our brothers stopped in, and he asked him, he said, you know where Armageddon is? And he says, yeah, yeah. He took off to the station, brought the map, and the brother says, you got the wrong map. So he went into his car and brought out the Bible, and he showed him in Revelation 16, 16. And he says, why did that man tell me his jalopy would take him to Armageddon? So the brother started to study with him, and today that gas attendant is one of our brothers in the coast. You know? Isn't that something? But I think this one takes the case. These secret police, they remind me of Hollywood movies. These cloaks and daggers stuff, you know. And they're trying to catch an elderly sister who has in her home literature, but they're never able to catch her. Somehow they always come too quick or too late, but never when the literature is there. But they're so annoyed with it, they bring literature with her, them, and they're going to plant it in the house and put her under arrest. So one day the two plainclothes men come, and they, one man says, well, I'll search the house, you talk to her. And one's in the living room talking 
So I your sister there, and the other one makes believe he's searching the house. And when he comes to the kitchen, he opens up the oven, pulls out the magazines, and he slips them in the oven, closes the oven door. And then he comes to the living room, and the man says, didn't you find anything? He says, no, I didn't find a single thing. So the other man says, well, then, come on, let me help you, and we'll look. And they go into the kitchen, he says, did you look in the oven? The man says, no, I didn't look in the oven. And he knew he did. He knew he planted the stuff there. So he opens the oven door, and lo and behold, there's a pie in the oven. And these two policemen look at each other like scared rabbits. They just take off out of that house, don't even say another word. And the sister is amazed, wondering what happened. And as soon as they leave, another sister came over and she says, I saw you had the police with you. I promised you that I was going to bring you a pie. So I came through the back door, and when I opened up the oven, I saw you put the magazines in the oven, and I knew they would look there, so I took the magazines and I left the pie there. <laughs> so, I think those police think that place is spooked. They'll never go back there again. Isn't that something? Jehovah makes fools out of these people. But it's nice to see how they work to get literature in. We have today literature coming into the Iron Curtain countries from various areas. There's no problem. Free flow of literature to those places. Give you an idea, a sister trying to get in Bibles into Russia. She has 30 Russian Bibles. How do you get Bibles into Russia? She finds out that there's a certain custom place that you can get through with a shopping bag. They don't look into shopping bags if you carry one shopping bag. So she puts 15 Bibles in one shopping bag and 15 Bibles in the other, and she waits near the border till a woman is coming without any shopping bag. And she stops the woman and she says, will you take my shopping bag through because it's kind of heavy for me? The woman says, I'll be glad to not realize that she's carrying Bibles. She watches the custom officials whether they stop her or not. Right through the woman goes, so our sister follows her right through. On the side, she says, I'll take the bag now. Thirty Russian Bibles then. And if we see this young woman, you would be, you thank Jehovah to having such people in his organization. Beautiful person. A blonde. <laughs> Doing the work for the great Jehovah. Isn't that nice? Putting lives on the line. I know one time I was doing some work, and uh, we were in Germany at the time, and the brother says, do you want to see your contact into behind the Iron Curtain? I said, I'd be happy to be able to see it. He says, all right, you go into this other room, and I'll talk to them to see if they want themselves to be seen by you. And I was curious, what type of people would these be? After all, they're going to have to go through the needle's eye and get through the other side. What kind of person is putting on his, line, his life on the line for Jehovah? Then he came in, in their 20s, a man and wife that drive a truck. And they're a beautiful couple, more beautiful couple you could not see. And I praise God right on the spot to finding such people to do work, critical work, in this crucial time of the end. Printing paper. In the olden days, you know what it is? To print underground, you can't buy paper like you do here. You've got to give reasons for your printing. You've got to have this. But our dear brothers have techniques they get all the paper they want. But in the olden days, in the early days, would you believe they marshaled all the children together and had the children go into all the stores and buy the regular 8 by 11 paper from school? And they had children buy pencils because you need ink. And they made ink from the lead. They took the lead out of the lens pencils, ground it up, made a mixture and made ink from that and printed the watchtower on school paper so our brothers could get it. And the children, young ones, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, 
helped in this work. Isn't that beautiful? And then had children do that. I always laugh at the experience where they, at one time, caught our brothers. But they moved the whole press from the underground, and the only thing that was left was one of these cutters, you know, with a hand. And upon the basis of this cutter, they arrested our brothers. They took them to court, and the prosecuting attorney, our brothers hired an attorney too, the prosecuting attorney says that, Your Honor, hundreds of thousands of pieces of literature are printed by these people against the law of the state and this machine. This cutter is used for that purpose. And then when the brothers' the attorney got on, he had one of the presidents from one of the main printing concerns come into the trial. He subpoenaed him, and there the president was sitting there, and he was looking at this cutter. And that man's talking about hundreds of thousands of books and pieces of literature, and this president looked at that piece, of, and, and so the attorney says, Did you hear what the prosecuting attorney said? He says, Tell the court, honestly, could it be done with a cutter like this? The man says, that thing belongs in the Smithsonian Institute, he says. It could never be done. The judge said, court dismissed. But our brothers did use that cutter to cut those thousands of pieces of literature. In fact, they sharpened knives, and with the knives would cut the literature. One time, a dear sister was mistaken. She let two secret police into her house. And in the basement was a press. And they sealed the door and said, no one is to go in and remove the press because they came in the evening. They're going to come in the morning and pick it up. Our dear sister was an elderly sister that had this house. She didn't know what to do. So she called the brother who was in charge of moving the press in. And he says, don't worry, sister. The underground went to work. The brothers came in here to her house, and they already had planned for such an eventuality. They put a dummy window into the basement that the police didn't even know of. From the outside, they opened the dummy window, and that night moved the whole press out through the dummy window, put the dummy window back in. In the morning, the, press came, or the police came, they saw the door still sealed, opened the door, and no press. But this is our brothers behind the Iron Curtain. I've taken enough of your time. Now let's look at them and appreciate what a wonderful family we have in those various parts of the earth. Thank you, Bill.